it's an absolute delight to be able to introduce uh, Professor Tim Davis. It would take a rather long time to go through a full resume, but what I can describe Tim as is a truly good neighbour, because if you're in different parts of the world, um, Nottingham, which is where Tim works, um, he's the honorary professor there, and it's geographically very close to us here at home in Derby. He's a great support, a great colleague. He has a Hunterian professorship from the Royal College of Surgeons, is the past editor of the Journal of Hand Surgery, um, made a huge contribution to research and chaired the BSSH Research Committee, and is also past president of the British Society for Surgery of the Hand. Um, in his spare time, I understand he has been spotted in Lycra, is a keen cyclist, and his ambition is to win the Tour de France. So we'll be watching out for you, Tim. But tonight he's going to talk to us um, on dilemmas in carpal tunnel syndrome. So, Tim. Okay. Oh. All right, which one is it? There we go. Just a minute, sorry. Let's try that again. Is it gone? Are you all seeing what I hope you are? Uh, we see, we seen you, we seen you, the presentation. Yes. Okay, and you are. That's perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Carlos. I just wonder if I should call the RSPCA about the treatment of your cat, but I'll refrain <laughs> for the moment. We all know carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, it's common, uh, and it's a bread and butter of hand surgeons. Uh, there's a lot we know about it, but there's an awful lot we don't know about it. And that's what I think is the interesting part, which I'm going to try and talk about what interests me today. Uh, I'll be going through the dilemmas I've had on causation, the diagnosis, uh, treatment pathways, and the management of failed treatment. And I think that will be quite enough. I think everybody would accept that the pathology of carpal tunnel syndrome, the final common pathway, is increased pressure within the carpal tunnel. I mean, that goes, that's standard and has been well shown. Uh, but what causes the increased pressure in the carpal tunnel? That is interesting. And in the past, various studies, I've quoted one here, which I wrote, but others have as well, uh, have shown that paper carpal tunnel sufferers have more square wrists than people without carpal tunnel who have more rectangular wrists if you compare the depth to the width, uh, which is interesting. And all the, all the studies on this seem to show the same thing. So it's unlikely to be a rogue event. And that probably means it, it, there may be some genetic uh, basis for it. And that in 2019 was shown by Dominic Furnitz's group in Oxford who looked at uh, the genetic makeup of people with carpal tunnel syndrome compared to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of controls. And they found that variations in genes which are thought to uh, affect growth and also the, for, uh, the constitution of the extracellular matrix architecture uh, were associated with carpal tunnel sufferers and were more common in them which suggests that uh, there may be something about genetics which alters, as they say, the environment through which the median nerve transits. And the one of the, I mean, I've read the paper, I'm no geneticist and I didn't understand most of it, but one of the associations they showed was an association with genetic vari gene vari variants which were associated with short stature. So I think we're going to find more and more genetics coming into this. This isn't an autosomal dominant or autosomal re uh, recessive uh, genetic uh, causation. It's more complex than that as far as I can see. And it's just watch this space. But like most things, I think it's going to come more and more genetic. It seems everything is turning out genetic. There are constitutional risk factors for carpal tunnel syndrome. And this is just a a diagram. We looked at a group of men for another reason and looked at the risk factors in them, the constitutional risk factors. We found no risk factors in about half, and one risk factor in about of these ones in about a third, and then two in about a sixth, and then fewer then. And some of them are quite easy to understand or hypothesize what's causing them, like an inflammatory arthritis. You're going to have a tenosynovitis, which will increase increase the contents of the carpal tunnel and thereby could reasonably increase the pressure. Uh, 
If you've got wrist osteoarthritis or basal thumb arthritis or fracture your wrist, that will alter the, can alter the uh, uh, cross-sectional area of the carpal tunnel, osteophytes penetrating into the carpal tunnel and such, and that could explain it. But then if you look at obesity, which is a, by far in this group of men which we studied, was by far the most common risk factor for carpal tunnel syndrome. And then diabetes, and which was about one, uh, I think less than 10%, and thyroid disease, which was lower. What is causing them to cause carpal tunnel syndrome, those conditions to cause carpal tunnel syndrome? Why would that increase the pressure in the carpal tunnel, any of those? Some have suggested that you, if you're obese, you get fat deposition in the carpal tunnel. But whenever I've, whenever I've looked at a carpal tunnel uh, during surgery, there doesn't seem to be much fat around in it. It's not a fatty structure. And I've thought about this at all. And I had to do a viva for a PhD in uh, Sweden, in Malmo of Thompson, who had done studies on the posterior interosseous nerve in, carpal in diabetics with carpal tunnel syndrome and others with carpal tunnel syndrome. And what he did was in people having carpal tunnel surgery, he had consented them to take a biopsy of the posterior interosseous nerve on the back of the wrist, a nerve which no way could be affected by carpal tunnel syndrome. It's my, the other side of the wrist, it's not the median nerve. And he took biopsies of these posterior interosseous nerves and compared them with a group of controls, uh, biopsies of posterior interosseous nerve taken out in people without carpal tunnel syndrome. And then they analyzed them by counting the density of myelinated nerve fibers uh, per millimeter and uh, these other things, which mean nothing to me. And he found that compared to controls, the diabetics had significantly fewer myelinated fibers per millimeter in, in density than the controls. And also the non-diabetics with carpal tunnel syndrome had fewer myelinated uh, uh, fibers. And he postulated that in carpal tunnel patients, for some reason, there was demyelination of the posterior interosseous nerve. Now that's entirely reasonable. Uh, it's only one study and it needs, you need further studies to confirm it, but it does suggest that there may be more to carpal tunnel syndrome than just increased pressure in the carpal tunnel. And it has led people to hypothesize that carpal tunnel syndrome can occur without any risk factors uh, in people if there is a marked increase in the pressure of the, in the carpal tunnel for whatever reason. But it's suggested that you may need, if you've got a sick median nerve because something's wrong with it, because nerves in general, uh, the general in the body are sick, not into, in good performance, a less marked increase in the pressure in the carpal tunnel can cause a carpal tunnel syndrome to clinically develop. In other words, you need increased pressure, but if you have a nerve which isn't entirely normal because you've got some neuropathy, it may be very mild, uh, mild that will increase the, uh, that will mean that you can get carpal tunnel syndrome at a lower pressure and therefore you'll get more people getting carpal tunnel syndrome. And if you look in endocrinology journals, there's a lot of muttering at the moment about metabolic neuropathies. Uh, there isn't much on it, but they are hypothesizing, and there is some evidence to show that, yes, diabetes, we all know they get peripheral neuropathies, which can cause their own problems uh, if severe, uh, but many diabetics have very mild ones, which aren't clinically apparent, but may be enough to cause carpal tunnel syndrome at a lower pressure than normal. And it is suggested that in obesity, you get similar changes in, uh, in nerves. So it may be, and this is all a bit speculative, that in the future, carpal tunnel syndrome is not just due to a tight carpal tunnel, but there has to be an involvement of a nerve which isn't entirely normal in the future. And I think that's interesting and could explain quite a, some, quite a few of the risk factors which aren't immediately obvious, the causation of them. But it's not fact, uh, it's possibility. So coming to the diagnosis, how do we diagnose it? Well, the history to me is absolutely everything. You go to sleep all right, you wake in the middle of the night with a dead hand and shake it to a gown, and then you, the 
the symptoms wear off, but your hand's dead on waking in the morning. And when you, you grip objects, it brings on the symptoms. And that is so convincing that I often find as I've become aged in clinic, that I take a history and then uh, basically uh, talk to the patients about carpal tunnel syndrome, explain the surgery and list them for the surgery. And it's only when they've left the room, I realize I forgot to examine the hand. Uh, which does suggest maybe I should retire completely. Uh, but the history is so good that uh, I, don't, I think that's actually quite safe if you take a good history. Examination, well, I go through the maneuvers with Phelan's tinnels and the hands and elevation tests. And yes, there are studies showing that their specificity and, and sensitivity, uh, but it often depends on how you do them. And I'm quite happy to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome if all of them are negative and say somebody hasn't got carpal tunnel syndrome based on the history if uh, one or two of them are positive. But that's quite straightforward. And then we enter the disputed area of the value of nerve conduction studies and diagnostic steroid injections. What about neurophysiology? Uh, well, this paper, the title says it all. Uh, it's actually, it could just as well be the abstract for the paper. It was done in Norway uh, by two Norwegian surgeons. And they basically did this quite clever study as they had 68 patients with typical carpal tunnel syndrome, the history and uh, was good. And they all had nerve conduction studies which were done preoperatively, but neither the surgeon or the patient was told the result. They all had an open carpal tunnel release. And of the 68, 63 had good outcomes, but 12 had normal nerve conduction studies. And therefore, if nerve conduction studies had been seen as the prime determinant of carpal tunnel syndrome as a diagnostic factor, those 12 would have been excluded from having carpal tunnel surgery and would have been left uh, with no diagnosis, uh, which I don't think is entirely satisfactory. Two didn't improve and both had normal nerve conduction studies. So if you'd done nerve conduction studies on these 68, 68 and followed the nerve conduction studies rather than clinical acumen, you would have saved two unnecessary operations but not have done 12 probably necessary operations. And I think that is my experience is that I tend to ignore nerve conduction studies and I think the clinical uh, findings are usually entirely adequate. And as they say, nerve conduction studies contribute little to the diagnosis in typical cases of carpal tunnel syndrome, to which I would add, I think all cases of carpal tunnel syndrome should be typical. I don't think there really are atypical cases, provided you can get a good history uh, from the patient you're dealing with. So what about steroid injections? And now we're going back to even before I was a consultant uh, to a paper by David Green, who's the first editor of Green's Operative Hand Surgery in 1984, who did a retrospective study of 199 patients with carpal tunnel syndrome treated with a steroid injection. And his conclusions from that, and it was a notes review, but it confirms all my biases, which I'm telling you, is that steroid, about it, is steroid injections are very effective at relieving symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome, but the effect is usually transient. And more importantly, a good response to an injection predicts a good surgical outcome, which means that they're an excellent uh, diagnostic test uh, if you're uncertain of the diagnosis. And if I'm uncertain of the diagnosis, I now do steroid injections as my prime test rather than nerve conduction studies. I started doing it when the waiting list in Nottingham for carpal, uh, nerve conduction studies was six months or more and have carried on uh, because it seems so effective. And it gives the patient confidence that it's worth the surgery because if you tell them the inject everything which should go with the surgery permanently, which goes with the injection, it boosts their confidence in the surgery. So coming on to treatment, uh, the managers of the NHS have become involved in this uh, with the production of this uh, consultation document in 2018, which caused quite a bit of consternation. And basically it was looking at 20 or so common conditions uh, which they thought were being overtreated. 
uh, with surgery. And one of those was carpal tunnel syndrome. And they produced evidence that many patients underwent unnecessary carpal tunnel surgery and claimed that many of those which had had surgery could have been managed quite accurately non-operatively with either steroid injections or wrist splints. And their evidence produced was a marked variation in carpal tunnel surgery rates, rates when standardized for age and sex across England. Uh, it didn't include Scotland or Northern Ireland as it was NHS England. Down at the bottom here, you've got Lincolnshire and Norfolk area, Norwich area down here, right at the bottom with very low rates of carpal tunnel surgery. And up here, you've got Liverpool, 40-fold increase uh, in the rate compared to Norwich of carpal tunnel surgery, which is rather comparable to their uh, positions in the Premier League at the end of the season. There was a massive difference between Norwich and Liverpool. And they said, well, obviously, all of these aren't necessary because otherwise they would be being done in Norwich or Lincolnshire and everything. And because of that, they set diagnostic criteria for when surgery should be done. And two groups were invited to comment on their, uh, the NHS England suggested criteria. The first were the neurophysiologists. And their proposal for all, nerve con uh, all, all carpal tunnel syndrome was, studies was to have nerve conduction studies on the lot to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome, not just to confirm the diagnosis, but also because they felt they could predict outcome. And they confidently stated that if you had grade one to three neurophysiological, not clinical changes, uh, you could be successfully treated with night splints or a steroid injection. If you had grade four to six, that's worse neurophysiology, then you needed surgery. And they didn't say what to do uh, if the nerve conduction studies were normal. Uh, which is interesting because I do believe a lot of people, or well not a lot, but some patients with carpal tunnel syndrome have normal nerve conduction studies, but often obviously a lot depends on what the definition of neuro normal neurophysiology is, and that does still vary from center to center. So that was their suggestion. And their arguments for it were basically, they looked at the outcomes of treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome, first on the left, injection with steroid and surgery. And they showed that there were more bad results with surgery than with injection, and somewhat ignored the fact that green is good in this, red is bad, that there were a lot more green, good outcomes uh, from surgery than with injection. But that was their evidence. But if you look at the data behind it, there are some concerns that the steroid injection outcomes were assessed at six weeks post-injection, uh, when most steroid injections would still have be having an effect and not wearing off. And the carpal tunnel surgery was three months on, uh, which is probably enough for carpal tunnel surgery, but you'd wonder if there's some improving. And so I think if they'd done their study with the outcomes at one year, I think these graphs would have been, these diagrams would have been very different. So I don't really think this tells us that surgery is dangerous and steroid injections are just as good in the long term. They may be in the short, well, I'm sure they are in the short term in most people. They give dramatic improvement in, in people with intermittent symptoms and are really, uh, really return the hand to normality. So what did they say? Grade one to three should be treated with steroid injections, grade four to six without. And their argument was that was because they looked at the pre-op neurophysiological grade to the surgical outcome, uh, which was a patient's opinion of the effect of surgery. And they really thought that one to three, the surgical outcomes uh, didn't justify the risks, whereas four to six, uh, where the outcomes weren't as good, I presume some of these in six were having permanent numbness uh, before the surgery went as good. And use that as an argument. Again, green, red is bad, green is good. And that was their conclusion. But their follow-up varied between three to 24 months. Uh, and, uh, three, and so that may have affected it. And I really don't think there's much justification for say, saying that these results are, are that different 
And also it's interesting that these are grade naught, that's normal neurophysiology. And the interesting thing is though they're affect determining treatment on neurophysiology with surgery, two thirds of those with normal nerve conduction studies who they saw responded to the surgery well and did well. So I find neurophysiological uh, physiology confusing. And I do believe, and it's been well shown, that the relationship between your severity of your symptoms and your neuro neurophysiological degree does not correlate at all well. You can have severe symptoms with very mild neurophysiological change, and you can have very few symptoms with severe neurophysiological, neurophysiological change. So it is not clear on that matter. And you've got to ask yourself, why does a patient want carpal tunnel surgery? Well, I think the indication for surgery and why I offer it is they are fed up with the severity of their symptoms despite non-operative treatment, and I, uh, which could be tried beforehand. And I think that is the absolute indication for surgery, and they're prepared, they're basically set, they're fed up with their symptoms, prepared to take the risk of surgery, having had the risks explained to them. Because like all surgery, it doesn't work every time, and some people can be made worse. Do they care what neurophysiological grade they are? Does it matter? And if they've got mild uh, symptoms, but a severe neurophysiological, oh, I, I cut that, just leave it there. Do they care about their neurophysiological grade? I don't think they do. So the BSSH proposal for intermittent carpal tunnel syndrome, which I'm glad to say was accepted by an NHS England, was if it's nuisance value, no treatment. There's no point telling patients, well, you've got mild carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, it could suddenly get worse and leave you with a permanently damaged hand, uh, which won't recover with surgery. I've never seen that. Uh, in my experience, most people who start with intermittent symptoms never get permanent numbness. The permanent numbness which occurs is all in, in my practice is almost always in the elderly and often develops without a period of intermittent symptoms beforehand. And here we're talking about a proposal for intermittent symptoms, not permanent numbness, where I'd go straight for surgery. If it's troublesome, we agreed that it would be reasonable to try non-operative treatment for a period, night splints or steroid injections. I personally have found little evidence that night splints do much apart from temporarily allow you to sleep better. But some people do seem to respond for a very long time and for steroid injections. The trouble with at the moment is in the NHS, certainly in Nottingham, is that uh, the, uh, GP, the, the, the system of cars GPs refer to, to refer patients to sort of uh, centres where they're allocated to treatments. And the treat, the, these allocation centres are trying to avoid referral to surgeons. And they can easily provide night splints, but not so easily steroid injections, which may be a good thing because you don't want people who are not experienced in giving steroid injections to give them for fear of damaging the nerve. But I'm unconvinced of the value of night splints compared to steroid injections. Well, very much unconvinced. And then if it remains troublesome or that doesn't settle it down, uh, then go for surgery. Nottingham now insists on two steroid injections for go before going to surgery, but my experience, if one doesn't work for a very long time, a second one is unlikely to. So that's what the NHS England proposal is. Uh, the neurophysiologists didn't like it because they said neurophysiology is needed to determine what treatment is best, and they've got their evidence for it, and predict the outcome of surgery and they may be seeing a completely different spectrum of carpal tunnel syndrome to us because they may be seeing patients uh, who, who the GPs didn't consider warranted referral to surgery. But I would say this, that uh, neurophysiologists themselves have looked at, at factors which have predict the outcome of carpal tunnel surgery. And this is their own research, no hand surgeons involved. And what came top of the list for predicting the outcome of carpal tunnel surgery. Reported benefit from steroid injection, way above, well, above nerve conduction studies, and rather to my surprise, way above night waking. And I suspect that's because it depends on how, night waking depends on how you ask the question. 
So by their research alone, uh, you could argue that a steroid injection is just as good, if not, is better than nerve conduction studies in predicting the outcome of surgery and also may avoid the need for surgery if you find it produces lasting relief. So I'm a great fan of steroid injections. So is there overtreatment on many, in, uh, in many areas of England of carpal tunnel syndrome as suggested by this graph? Well, this is, I think, rather amusing because it caused a lot of heated argument, uh, storm in the whirlpool and everything like that. But was one eminent retired surgeon once told me that the biggest cause of controversy and uh, condition, uh, diagraphs like this is cock-up. And this, I think, is a complete and utter cock-up. Here you are recording the rates of carpal tunnel surgery according to hospital episode statistics, HESS data. Now HESS data records said treatments done in secondary care in hospitals. It may record some done in primary care, but the likelihood is if you have your carpal tunnel done in an area where they're all not allowed to go to hospital, but are done in primary care, and there are quite a few areas around the country which do that, they will not be recorded on this uh, in HESS data. Now Lincolnshire, I know for a fact, almost all their, this is the bottom one down here, all their carpal tunnel syndromes are done in primary care. Norwich, they're all done in primary care. And, this, and these are all Norfolk and Norfolk area where they're done, and Lincolnshire down to here. These are all done in primary care. So this graph is showing actually the number of carpal tunnel releases done in hospitals which is, bears no relevance to the number of carpal tunnels done in each CCG. And vast numbers of carpal tunnels are being done in Lincolnshire and Norwich, which would bring them right up, or maybe not approaching Liverpool, but getting to that level. So all of this was a bit of a storm in the teacup. teacup and uh, I think NHS England are a bit embarrassed because they know that's what, that what this showed. So what's my management of clinical carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, it's a clinical diagnosis, nuisance value, no treatment. Troublesome, give a steroid injection, but no nerve conduction studies. If it remains troublesome after steroid injection, I usually go straight to surgery. But if they come back and say, well, that steroid injection worked well for a year, I don't want to have surgery, I give another steroid injection because it worked a long time. And I've got some people who then come back after another year saying, can I have another injection? And I will give repeat injections, uh, but, I, but, I tell, but it's really only if they last a good long time. I know you're supposed not to give more than three injections for most things of steroid, but I don't know where the rule comes from. Uh, but I, I've certainly given more than three uh, to some patients with carpal tunnel syndrome who've had a year or more relief from one injection. So, pretreatment neurophysiology, in my view, is unnecessary in most cases, though it may have use in, face, in patients who fail to respond to surgery. But I tend to use it in patients with community, can use it with patients with communication difficulties, but I think it's less useful than a response to steroid. You can use it if there are multiple potential causes of symptoms but I tend to, I find it less useful than a response to a steroid injection because anything which doesn't go away with a steroid injection is probably not due to carpal tunnel syndrome and everything which goes away with it is probably due to, to it, which seems to clarify the issue. And then the dreaded vibration exposure, it may be as useful as a response to steroid injection. And that's basically, if people who've used vibrating tools, they can get, uh, uh, hand arm vibration syndrome, uh, which doesn't really mimic carpal tunnel syndrome, but can be confused with it. So, failure. It does happen. Carpal tunnel syndrome doesn't always respond to surgery. And by this, I mean that the persistence, pre the symptoms which were there preoperatively persist. I don't mean pain due to the surgery, CRPS, but a failed carpal tunnel surgery is where the symptoms you went, wanted to treat 
which he thought were due to carpal tunnel syndrome, don't go away. And there are two causes of that, in my view. One is the patient never had carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, it was an incorrect diagnosis. And I would stress again that I don't believe that atypical carpal tunnel syndrome exists uh, as long as you can get a clear history from the patient. It could be a, and the incorrect diagnosis could also occur because of over, too much uh, emphasis on the nerve conduction study results, remembering that nerve conduction studies aren't black and white, normal or abnormal. There will be a gray area where some people with carpal tunnel syndrome lie in their nerve conduction studies and some people who don't have it lie. Okay. And basically, whatever the nerve conduction studies state, my opinion would be if it's not a classic history, then the nerve conduction studies are likely to be falsely positive and I would give a steroid injection and see what happened. And if that improved them, then I would, that would, that would make me conv more convinced it was carpal tunnel syndrome. But if it made no effect, I would believe it was. And the other cause is incomplete release of the flexor retinaculum, uh, that a, a, a constriction remains, which is compressing the nerve. So how do I assess these? I mean, I should stress we get hardly any of these in Nottingham, but when they do come, this is how I deal with it. And I go back to their preoperative symptoms. And it's, it's amazing, many people forget what they wear, uh, but so you have to keep repeating them and trying to remember. And you've got to ask, were they consistent with carpal tunnel syndrome? Were they woken in the middle of the night so that they could go to sleep okay and they were fast asleep and then woke up with the numbness and tingling, had to shake their hand and resolve. Uh, so just to ask them, does it tingle at night? Doesn't really help because it could be that it was tingling when they went to bed, remained tingling the whole time and kept them awake. Was the patient treated with a steroid injection? If so, did it work? If it did, it sounds it was carpal tunnel syndrome. If it didn't, I'd be cautious and think it probably wasn't. And if they had nerve conduction studies, need to know what they show. And then postoperatively, I'd check, are these the same symptoms as they had preoperatively? The, and just check that. And then if they had intermittent symptoms preoperatively, but also permanent numbness, is it just the permanent numbness which persists? Have the intermittent symptoms gone? Because if you've got a, the permanent numbness can take months to settle. But, if the in, but I believe the intermittent symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome, if they're there as well as permanent numbness or wooliness of the hand, the intermittent symptoms should go virtually immediately with the carpal tunnel release, whereas the permanent ones go. So ask about intermittent symptoms. Did you have them before and have they gone and are you just left with permanent numbness? And then if there's permanent numbness still, just ask how long was it, look and see how long it was since the surgery. Has it had time to resolve? And it can seem to take quite a long time. I usually say three to six months for it to go away if there's permanent numbness, but some take longer and some don't seem to recover. Uh, I can't say how much it is in my practice because I don't think I follow people up long enough. So those are the things I ask. And just one thing to say, I do not believe that you can have pure thena wasting, and this is pure abductor pollicis brevis wasting, with no sensory loss in carpal tunnel syndrome. I don't believe that occurs. You have to have sensory symptoms at some stage uh, and, and those persisting either as tingling, and, tingling or permanent numbness. I don't believe it's ever due to carpal tunnel syndrome, but I've seen people who've had surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome on the basis of this. This is either thoracic outlet syndrome, which in my experience, for some reason, in few, some patients particularly picks off first the thena muscles uh, and that's thoracic outlet syndrome or neurog neurological disease and that could be the first sign of motor neuron disease or all sorts of other things, the names of which I can't say. The other things I do is I look at find the operation note and see who did the surgery because that's quite important. Was it a surgeon who's done hundreds of them or was it a trainee on their first solo episode? And then I'd love to know the surgeon's findings, what they found, was the nerve narrowed, was the flexor retinaculum thick, 
uh, did they do a test to see they'd released both uh, ends of the retinaculum properly? I wiggle a new, uh, McDonald around on both ends and see if I can twist it around. And if I can, I think I've released it. And did it, the carpal tunnel appear tight. But the operation notes inevitably say what incis incision was moved, used so that if you can't see the hand for any reason, you know what was used post-operatively and what suture material was recorded. But there's very little in most notes recorded about what was actually found at the time of surgery. And then I look at the operation incision, see where it was and particularly how long it was. And this was a, an old slide where I said, and I would, but I would still look at Phelan's and Tinnell's tests on both sides and compare them. I don't think I'd do any precise sensory testing, but I would ask if there was numbness. And then come to a conclusion on that. Having uh, and sorry, then do investigations. And a diagnostic steroid injection, I think, is still useful in this because if it resolves everything, it suggests ongoing carpal tunnel syndrome. But I fully appreciate that if you've got an implant complete release of the flexor retinaculum, sometimes maybe due to edema and everything, you've made the carpal tunnel worse and the symptoms worse. So, a st and you may have developed permanent numbness, so a steroid in which a steroid injection won't get rid of. If nerve conduction studies are done, if they're negative, uh, you got to think, what is the significance of that? Does it mean that they had carpal tunnel syndrome, which has been treated? Or if there were no pre-op nerve conduction studies, these are done following it. If there were no pre-op carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, preoperative neurophysiology, does it mean they never had carpal tunnel syndrome? So you've got to look at it like that and we really need to know the pre-op ones if they were done. And if they're positive, you would want to know if you had them, if they're any different to the preoperative ones. And then you've got to stop and think, if, have they had time to improve? But I would say here that nerve conduction studies do not always return to normal following carpal tunnel surgery. So I think they are con confusing to interpret, but I do appreciate that in recurrent, in persistent carpal tunnel syndrome, if you've got preoperative results to compare with postoperative, they are useful. But for the number of failed carpal tunnel surgeries, I, I think they're not cost effective, and I think there are other ways of assessing what is likely to be going on uh, in somebody with persistent carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms. So. What do I do? Well, if the pre-op symptoms are not consistent with carpal tunnel syndrome, you've either got to look for another cause if they're troublesome or and do investigations or advise no further treatment or investigation. And I think you've just got to be honest with the patient that you don't, you just, it doesn't fit for carpal tunnel syndrome. And I don't think reoperation was going to help and let them ask whatever questions they want. I mean, some will almost try and force you to do a revision carpal tunnel and I have been forced to do it when I have a, no belief that it would work. But as long in those, if it gives them closure, I am happy to do it as long as they realize the risks of surgery and that I personally don't think it will work. If, however, the preoperative symptoms are typical for carpal tunnel syndrome, I offer a revision surgery, but with a guarded prognosis, not as good as a primary one. And uh, I think the symptoms, the, the things which are, are likely uh, to predict the outcome, a uh, comparison with the preoperative situation. I think there's a high chance of success if before the if the original surgery was performed by an inexperienced surgeon, because I suspect it's it's far more likely there will have been an incomplete carpal tunnel release with that with a surgeon flying a solo for the first time than with an experienced consultant. If the post-op symptoms are typical of carpal tunnel syndrome and the same as the pre-op ones. And if you do give steroid injections, if that dramatically improves the post-op symptoms, that's, I think, it's a very good prognostic indicator for that there has been an incomplete carpal tunnel release and it would be worth doing a revision carpal tunnel. But a revision surgery, I think, has got less chance of six surgery if, done, if the original surg surgery was done by an experienced surgery. If the post-op symptoms are vague-ish, could be carpal tunnel syndrome, could not and if there was no benefit from steroid injection. But it's not an exact science. I would state that I am convinced, and I've met some of them, there are a, that there are a small number of patients who give an absolutely classic history for carpal tunnel syndrome 
well, the night waking fits perfectly, the gripping objects fit perfectly. But if you do normal nerve conduction studies on them, they'll be normal. If you give them a steroid injection, they will be normal. And in those, if you do surgery, my experience, even when done by me or other, uh, other surgeons uh, with a great experience, great experience than me, doesn't work. And they most certainly will not respond to revision surgery. So that's quite, it's useful to go and see if in the past they'd had steroid injections and how they responded. But normal nerve conduction studies and no response to steroid injection uh, before the original surgery means that I think they're of this group. I have no clue what's wrong with them, but there are a few, I don't see many of them, uh, who you would be convinced had carpal tunnel syndrome, but do not respond to normal treatments. So what surgery do for them? Well, I do an extended carpal tunnel release, uh, as shown there. Uh, you can do them under local, and I often do, but beware if it's fairly shortly, and this is usually within a month or two of the original procedure, there's a lot of scar tissue around the, the carpal tunnel, the primary carpal tunnel scar, and that's quite difficult to anesthetize and inject local anesthetic in. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that, uh, and can be quite painful to do, but you can do it under local. Others prefer regional block, and I start proximally, find the nerve there, and trace it up. And I make sure that the incisions, I can see the whole, whole of the carpal tunnel right up to the distal end of it. And release any intact flexor retinaculum. And just a word, I do believe that in people, the flexor retinaculum following a carpal tunnel we can reform and can reform quite quickly. As I've explored carpal tunnels uh, three months or so following after they've been done by an eminent surgeon who's not going to mistake Guillaume's canal for the carpal tunnel and found it reformed. And there's a great talk about inspecting the nerve and looking at it and see what it looks like and whether it, and maybe doing a neurolysis. I don't think I ever do an external or internal neurolysis of the median nerve. I think the pathology you're trying to really treat is relief of the pressure and an intact flex, releasing any intact flexor retinaculum would do that. And then do write a detailed operation note and uh, record your view that no further surgery would be of benefit and tell the patient that. And I think this surgery should, revision surgery should either be done by a consultant or if not by, by somebody else with the consultant in surgery. And when I do it, I, I often delegate them, but I make an awful lot of noise in the theatre so that the patient knows for sure I'm in there uh, and can't afterwards say, but you weren't there, so how can you sure it was done properly? And I have a good look at the operation before the wound is closed. And that way it's, it solves the problem because I think if one revision carpal tunnel release doesn't work, there's no point doing any future ones. These are for ones where the symptoms just don't improve uh, following the original surgery. It's completely different to recurrent carpal tunnel syndrome where the, the patient gets much better, uh, all the carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms go, and then some years later or years the symptoms recur. That's recurrent carpal tunnel syndrome, which is due to increased pressure and a reformed flexor retinaculum, and the outcome of surgery for that is good. So those were my dilemmas. That's it. <laughs>